I'm going to talk to you about coming face to face with the dead, about looking into the blank expression of a death mask. These are curious and macabre objects, their final portraits teetering on the boundary of past and present. Death Mask, as Ernst Benkard wrote in his 1926 book on the subject, command our utmost reverence. The face is symbolic and perpetuates the final expression of a human spirit whom we once knew or who had made his mark on all men's minds. Oliver Cromwell, whose death mask we see here, certainly made his mark. I'm going to use this death mask as a starting point, and I'm going to discuss how and why it came into being, how it's an example of a tradition that extends back thousands of years, and we're going to offer some thoughts on why we, as humans, so often feel the need to preserve the image of and commemorate the dead, and how looking at these objects cause us to ponder our own mortality. Lord Protector of England from 1653 to 1658, Cromwell was responsible for the downfall of the monarchy and the death of King Charles I. It's amazing to think that this face, with its sunken eyes, that famous mole above the right eye, the lips pursed together and the bushy beard weighed down by the original mould, once belonged to a living, breathing man that wielded such great power. We see an expression of life, of character, but an eerie imprint of an original that no longer exists. It's fitting that the Ashmolean owns this death mask of Cromwell because of Oxford's prominent position in the Civil War. Um, after the parliamentary defeat of disenchanted royalist forces, Cromwell signed Charles I's death warrant and was declared Lord Protector, having refused the title of King. Just five years later, he died. Immediately after his death, a mould was made of his face and, this wooden, uh, and a wooden effigy and wax replica of his face made from the cast were laid in state at Somerset House. A contemporary account describes how this effigy held an auburn scepter and was wearing royal robes and a crown, despite Cromwell's own resistance at being called king. Following this ceremony, his body was laid to rest in the burial place of kings at Westminster. Two weeks later, the effigy was transported through the streets of London to great ceremony. His son Richard ruled for a short time afterwards, but in 1660, the monarchy was restored and Charles II came to the throne. Following the restoration, Cromwell's body was gibbeted at Tyburn and his head cut off and stuck on a spike outside Westminster Hall. Um, a pretty gruesome message to any other would-be royal usurper. Um, despite the fierce destruction of Cromwell's body, numerous plaster casts were made from the original wax mould, taken from his face after he died, which are now in various collections around the country. The information about the creation of these death masks and the order in which they were made is patchy, but their existence alone is enough to show the long-standing interest in this important figure and also the interest in the imprint of his face. Here are just a few of the known versions. Uh, Warwick Castle has one, reputedly a cast in the original wax mould. The National Portrait Gallery in London has four. The Museum of London has one. And the British Museum has a death mask once thought to be of Cromwell, but now widely regarded as a copy. You can see this one on the right, that his, his nose is narrower and wonkier and his cheeks a bit fuller. Um, the Ashmolean version was cast at some point during the 1800s um, from the mask at Warwick Castle. The afterlife of Cromwell's death mask and its various uh, copies is complex and mysterious, but as an object, it's certainly not unique. It's an example of, the of a practice that extends far back into the ancient world and speaks of the long-standing desire to hold on to the image of a person after they've died. Artists, of course, also create representations of people which continue to exist long after the person depicted has died. So before looking at examples of death masks and how their function has changed over the years, it's important to consider the ways in which they're similar to and different to um, artistically rendered portraits. On first look, there's a clear separation between these two types of representations. Whereas paintings and sculptures are prey to the artist's will, the death mask seems to represent the true, unaltered face of a person. More than in a likeness, they provide us with a solid, indexical image of a person, warts and all, particularly fitting when we think about Cromwell. 
Bindexical, I mean something that points to something else. For example, a footprint in the sand points to the fact that someone's been there. The exactitude of cast making captures and freezes every wrinkle, sag and scar. In this way, as Christine Quigley writes, it doesn't have to evoke the dead, it is the dead. The, the death mask possesses the indexicality of the photograph with the spatial dimension of sculpture. There are casts where sculptors interfered with the, with the cast. The eyes of um, Jonathan Swift's death mask, for example, were carved into the plaster for a more lifelike appearance. But, whoop, sorry, I'll leave those because I wonder if I can drop that. <laughs> uh, but in the original state, cast of faces produced the closest possible phys physical refiguring of a person. They are works of art from nature's own workshop, to quote Bencard, operating as the last symbol of man, his undying face. Portraits of, from life and death masks record the features of someone who is either dead or is going to die. Portraiture is therefore inextricably linked to mortality. Um, as Marcia Poynton has argued, um, portraits work against the dissolution of the body. The death masks emphasize the moment at which the, which the person is gone and the body starts to perish. It's been suggested that there's an innate inclination for the human race to cling on to the physical appearance of a person in order to preserve their memory. While I think it's dangerous to make universal statements about any kind of collective desire, for the sake of this discussion and the example that I'm looking at, it's useful to consider this idea. Hans Belting has argued that the introduction of these images of the dead into early societies marks the point at which physical images entered human use, most profoundly manifested in the cult of the dead. He writes, images, preferably three-dimensional ones, replaced the bodies of the dead who had lost their visible presence, along with their bodies. Threatened by the place left on earth after the parting of one of the community members, they were kept present and visible in the ranks of the living via their images. Even real skulls were given new life with shells attached to eyes and a coating of clay to resemble the skin as early as 7,000 BC in the Neolithic culture of the Near East. The Jericho skull in the Ashmolean, for example, is the case in point, with its cowrie shells for eyes and fragments of plaster that once covered the entire skull. The idea highlights the important exchange between the image of the dead and the space left on earth after their parting, and the artificial manifestation of this image and the viewer who interacts with the image and creates an iconic presence as opposed to a bodily presence. Thinking about death masks specifically, in ancient Egypt, Greece and Rome, the practice of taking a cast from the faces of the dead occurred. A death mask in Tuna al Bel, Egypt, from around, this, to around the time of Christ, is a well-preserved example. Um, similarly, a plaster bust of a man found in a tomb at the Apennestina in Rome, dating from the 3rd century AD, is a remodeled death mask. The eyes have been reopened and the contours of the face softened to give it a more lifelike appearance. It's the kind of thing that would have been used in the tradition of Imaginis Maiorum, images of ancestors, described by Pliny in Natural History. During fu fu Roman funerary rites, a wax cast of the dead person's face, known as the Imago, was fitted onto a dummy and carried into the forum. I think later on after this walk, there is a reenactment of one of these processions downstairs. Uh, this bust, therefore, is unusual, but having been made in plaster. In addition, an actor followed the procession wearing another version of the mask and mimicking the words and gestures of the deceased. After this, the body was preserved. A third cast was then painted and placed within the family home in a frame or cupboard in the shape of a temple, which was open on festival days or funerary ceremonies of other family members. In this way, the death mask acted as a means of commemoration. The etymology of the word image um, is in fact the Latin imago, meaning the representation in art of a person or thing, picture, likeness, or death mask of an ancestor. In the Middle Ages and early modern period, the death mask shifted to serve a more practical purpose, with greater emphasis put on its usefulness in creating recognisable royal funerary effigies than in its value as an object in its own right. The image I'm showing is from the 18th century, but it gives you a sense of what these things look like. In France at this time, whenever a king died, the court artist was summoned to take a cast of the monarch's face before the court physicians embalmed the body. 
With this cast, a wicker body was made to fit the face, which was dressed in linen and silk and wrapped in the coronation robes of French kings. Along with this, cast of the hands were taken, which were additionally added to the dummy, as well as hair for the head and beard. The wax face was then reawakened, the eyes opened, and the hollowed and rigid features of the death mask softened to create a more lifelike image of the king. This figure, having rested on the lead on earth for a week, was then processed throughout the streets of Paris. The death mask in this instance was not valued as an object in its own right, but for its use as a practical tool in funerary rites. It allowed for an expression of public grief. This practice existed well into the 16th century with Francis III, for example, who died at Rambouillet in 1547. As soon as he died, Francois Cluy, who painted this portrait, was ordered to make casts of the king's face and hands, which were then used in the above manner. For an astonishing 11 days, meals were served before it as if it were the living king. Used in this way, the augmented features of the cast, taken directly from the king's face, literally stood in for the deceased. The death mask is not treated as a representation of a person, but as an actual living body. In England, during the Quietus period, similar funerary rites took place. In Westminster Abbey, a number of royal examples are displayed, including that of Henry VII, who died in 1509, whose large wooden effigy would have been used in the same way. Covered with linen and stucco, it exhibits a pres impressive realism that suggests the death mask was used in its creation. Even though the eyes have been opened up, the pitted and aged skin is stretched across the contours of the face, and there's thin lips that seem to collapse inwards as in death. In the 17th century, the role of the death mask started to shift, and non-royal casts were taken from other famous faces, such as Oliver Cromwell, which is one of the early examples of this practice. During the 18th and 19th centuries, um, in France, Germany, and England, the famous faces of politics, science, art, and literature uh, were also commemorated in this way, increasingly serving not as parts of funeral effigies, but as blueprints for artistically rendered portraiture, as objects of commemoration displayed in more intimate settings, or as scientific tools used by phrenologists. Phrenologist, phrenology was a pseudoscience used to interpret the character of a person by analysing the shape of their head. Um, these are from the collection um, in Edinburgh, which belonged to the Phrenological Society. We've got Walter Scott there, William Wordsworth, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge at the bottom. During, During the, the Victorian, Victorian era, and in some respect, the apotheosis of death culture in this country, the, the production of death masks started to decline as post mortem photography emerged as the main way of capturing the final portrait of a person. This is one of the slightly less terrifying images of these things. <laughs> Spooky. Um, it's interesting to think about photography with regard to the production of death masks, as cast making was the primary form of automatic reproduction until the invention of photography. So, what was this method of reproduction? I should prepare you for the following photo, which is a pretty vivid example of how it's taken. Um, this, interesting, is taken within a caster's studio, unlike. Um, the settings which are normally in the, in the family home and you can see some of the previous death masks that have been taken in the back, some of which have been kind of sculpted into busts. Um, included in the 1926 book that I mentioned earlier uh, that was translated in 1929 into English and published by Leonard of Virginia Woolf um, is a note by a sculptor and caster on the making of death masks that begins with a descriptive explanation of the way the face changes after death. So long as the blood is yet warm and the muscles yet in action, the face is transfigured as if in the final glow of youth. Then the body grows cold, the features stiffen and change. Um, for cold, but the, deaths resemble, the deaths, dead resemble withering plants. And so it's necessary for the death mask to be taken before these physical changes occur. Tilting the head low to avoid compressing and augmenting the soft contours of the face, the eyes and lips are closed and the chin propped up. Each feature of the face, he tells us, is easily distorted and the process should be considered closer to modelling from life than taking a cast from an inflexible positive image. Although casts taken after the rigidity of rigor mortis has set in can be striking, what, he asks, are such masks to us? 
Clearly for Kolber, the purpose of the death mask was not so much to replicate a dead face exactly, but in providing an image that adequately represented the person in life. The smile of a soul released, he writes, must be shown devoid of the contouring effects of disease and suffering and must be handled carefully. On a practical level, he advises the following. The parts where the hair is growing are painted over with a thin solution of modelling clay with oil, so that the plaster may not adhere when it's poured over. The skin itself contains enough fat and needs no preparation. The outline of the masks, mask, the parts on the neck, behind the ears and so on, are surrounded with the thinnest of damp paper. A large bowl of plaster of the consistency of soup is ladled over the face a few millimetres in thickness. Then a thread is drawn over the middle of the forehead, the bridge of the nose, the mouth and the chin. A second bowl of more solid plaster is spread over the first layer like pulp. And before it sets, the thread is drawn away, dividing the whole into two halves. As soon as the outer layer has set hard, the halved mole is broken apart and carefully detached from the head. The halves thus attached are immediately fitted together again and clamped. The negative is cleaned and refilled with plaster. Roughnesses on the covering outer shell are carefully chipped away with mallet and chisel. And there we have the positive, the finished mask. This description shows exactly how the positive, the imprint of the deceased person's face, is sealed in the rigidity of plaster, pre preserving its exact appearance of the face at that moment for all time. Colbert was writing at the end of a period of extensive death mask production, when they were no longer confined to royalty, but were created to remember the lives of the famous and infamous. Over the course of their existence, however, they've served no numerous purposes, as I've shown. They've been used in commemorative ceremonies, as a starting point for effigies, as personal and intimate po po portraits, and as objects of science. So to conclude, people have attempted to cast one another into historical permanency throughout time. Whether sculpted or painted or cast in the case of death masks, capturing the features of a person's face has emerged as a common concern as people attempt to produce a tangible representation of a person no longer present. Whereas in portraits of living people, we experience some sort of interaction with the sitter, images of the dead disturb this connection. We become sol solitary observers, unable to relate to the image of a person that exists in a realm beyond our understanding of the world. Despite this complex relationship with these types of objects, our desire to preserve the final image of a person in funerary rites and secular commemoration, and thereby to question our own mortality, has appeared at countless moments in history and will no doubt continue to do so.